It's time for another Supreme Court nomination confirmation hearing. You may remember, we've been through this before, Judge Kavanaugh, the alleged high school gang rapist when he got on the court, just barely squeaked that one through. Then we had Amy Coney Barrett, who's going to steal everybody's uterus, including mine. And now we're at the moment where we've got child predator Kitanji. Kitanji Brown Jackson up for confirmation for the Supreme Court of the United States. And Josh Howley is making that allegation saying she's taking it easy on these child predators, saying that during her sentencing, she was giving them the absolute minimum. This is what it sounded United like. States versus Hawkins. This was a child pornography case where the defendant distributed multiple images of child porn, possessed dozens more, including videos. The federal sentencing guidelines recommended a sentence of 97 to 121 months in prison. Prosecutors recommended 24 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave the defendant three months in prison. All right, we're going to listen United to this States and break all this Chazen. down. There it's the, that case, the defendant possessed 48 files of child pornography. The federal guidelines recommended 78 to 97 months in prison. The we're going to break this down. recommended the same. Judge Jackson sentenced him to 28 months. Oh. United States versus Cooper. There, the defendant possessed dozens of images of child pornography and uh, distributed, I should say, distributed dozens of images of child pornography, possessed over 600. Different. The federal guidelines recommended 151 to 188 months in prison. That's a long time. The prosecutor recommended 72 months. Judge Jackson gave the defendant 60 months, which was the lowest sentence permitted by the law. Senator Josh Howley just going through a list of cases, each one of those a different defendant facing a different sentence based upon a number of different factors. And you heard him say the prosecution sort of recommended this. You judge gave him that though. And so what is he talking about? The different guidelines, the different maximums and minimums and recommendations. He's referring to these. These are the United States sentencing guidelines. This is a manual. You can see here it's big. Not only is the U.S. code big, massive, huge, you know, bookshelves worth of statutes. We also have manuals and different guides and regulations on how to interpret those laws. And so here you can see just when it comes to criminal sentencing, we have 608 pages here that are a part of this 2021 manual. And so it's very complicated process. What Josh Holly was just sort of detailing for us is a very, very specific process that judges go through, defense attorneys go through it, prosecutors do, and everybody works together to try to come up with what we all sort of you know, hope is a just sentence. And there's a whole book of guidelines about how this works. Let's learn a little bit about it. We can see here, number of different sections. We're gonna skip all the way down to part G. Part G involves offenses involving certain types of activity and the exploitation of certain types of people. You can see here that these are some of the most heinous types of crimes that people can imagine. And so bear that in mind as we read through some of these sections. You can see that this is covering page 204 all the way down to 221. And so we get about a solid 15, 16 pages, we'll see, of different details. We're not gonna go through all of it. I just wanna show you sort of how this works. And let's preface this, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about sentencing a person who has been convicted of a crime. And we're trying as a society to decide, well, how do we do this? Some people might say, well, let's just throw the entire book at that person and make sure that they just get executed immediately with no due process. And some people might say that's an appropriate mechanism or an appropriate way to handle these types of cases or any type of criminal case. And when people get very sort of uh, you know, aggressive with that type of law, I always ask people to sort of apply the, well, what if it was your child filter to this equation? Anybody can take a look at these charges and say, you know, that what needs to happen to that person is X, Y, and Z. But what happens if we just take that filter and we just say, all right, let's go to put a, uh, reframe this, put a new set of glasses on. What if the allegation was not against one of these people, but what if it was against a, a 19 year old son or daughter that happened to belong to you? Somebody who was in a problematic situation, let's say in college, they come home, they're depressed, they are maybe using drugs or alcohol or not, maybe they had a bad breakup, they meet some people, they poke around some nefarious parts of the internet, and they get into certain areas where they shouldn't probably be going, and they save some files that maybe they shouldn't be saving, and it's something that seems like it is you know, a crime of the century based on the conversations and the context and the imagery, and of course, it is absolutely heinous, but we're also talking about Sometimes people 
who are not actively sort of intentionally engaging with this type of stuff, who come across it and they experience it and they get caught up in the investigation. And if that were to happen to somebody who was 19 or 18 or somebody who was in your life, you might treat it differently. And this is sort of how we want to frame this from all perspectives. And when we take a look at that person, maybe you still say that person is 19 or 20 and they shouldn't have been doing that or this is perpetuating some. You may have a million different thoughts going through your mind thinking about these issues. They are very complex. But as a society, I think that what we all sort of want, whether you're a prosecutor or a defense attorney or a judge or just an everyday citizen and you just want to live in a safe society without your kids being preyed upon, we all have conversations about how do we get less of this, right? What's the point of our justice system? It's to reduce this stuff. We don't want to see more of this. Nobody wants to see more people who have uh, you know, dangerous predatory proclivities out on the streets. People think sometimes that defense attorneys are people who just want everybody running free and want madness and mayhem. No, we all have to live in the same society as everybody else. Our perspective is, you know, we often don't believe the government when they say something. We, we have seen many, many times when there are massive overstepping of boundaries on behalf of the government. Happens every day. It doesn't have to be a serious case like this, but it can even be a simple criminal traffic case or a DUI case. And if it happens in those cases, you can absolutely expect it's going to be happening in these cases as well. And so we have to understand that we're approaching it from a perspective where a defense attorney is keeping proper checks and balances on the government and ensuring that people who are oftentimes castigated as being the worst criminals, the you know, people who shouldn't even be given a second look, make sure that those people retain and maintain the presumption of innocence, that they get due process as we go through this, at, through this proceeding, but with the context and the framework from a defense perspective that we want to make sure the government you know, ac actually has evidence and that there's what they say happened actually happened. But we also want to help this individual become a, a better person as a result of this process. Okay. Oftentimes what we see are politicians and people in positions of power who don't actually think of the hum human side of a case like this or think of the the elements of a person internally that might have caused them to engage in that criminality they just say he's an evil person or she and they should be locked up or killed or thrown away with the garbage and from a defense attorney's perspective at least mine i can't speak for everybody but certainly from my perspective i want to try to see if we can help that person and communicate to the court and to the prosecution that this is an individual that is worthy of humanity, worthy of the opportunity for redemption. And rather than treating this person like a name and a case number, let's see if maybe there's something wrong or something that we can help this individual with to help put them back on the correct path. And when we approach these conversations and when Judge Kitanji Brown is sitting here and going into those conversations, I'm probably gonna guess that she's kind of of that same mindset recognizing that the people in front of her have been charged with some heinous things and, and very likely did them. They've been convicted of it. A jury of their peers found it that they did it or they agreed to it. They said, I pled guilty to these things. And the judge is now having to make a decision based on input from a number of different people, from the defense, defense attorneys like me, saying, judge, this is why we think this person should get the minimum. Here's a bunch of stuff you don't know about this person that is relevant about why this person maybe was involved in some of these things. Maybe that person was the subject of abuse. Maybe they were under duress or under some sort of stress. And you might say that is totally inconsequential and it shouldn't matter. And you have that perspective and you're, you're free to, to communicate that. And that's often what the prosecutors are doing. The prosecutors are saying, doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. This is the worst thing ever. And so they're asking typically for you know, a more aggravated or maximum sentence. This is the power of the adversarial system. And the judge is supposed to sort of take both sides, weigh an independent report that comes across from sort of an independent body who's overseeing the case from the, from a, the court's perspective and providing sort of three different reports. And the judge makes a decision based on a number of different factors. And let's look at how this might work. So here you can see, this is the guidelines manual. And let's take a listen or a look at one of the segments, sections from a type of crime that Josh Howley was talking about. Here he says, talking about the exploitation of certain categories of people of a very low age. 
receiving, transporting, or soliciting or advertising material involving those people. Okay, we're talking about photographs, material, some sort of item, you know, digital being transferred. Possessing material involving with the intent to traffic and possessing material involving the other exploitations. Now, all sorts of, you know, horrendous types of things that happen. I want to just show you how this works from a sentencing perspective. You can see here, if somebody is sort of in this category, we have what's called a base offense level. This will tell you that if this person is sentenced, if they're convicted under certain sections of the U.S. Code, so here 1466AB, here would be different section 2252A4, another one A5, and here's A7. And they're saying if this person is under any one of these subsections, they're going to start a base offense level at 18. This is where our starting point is going to be. And we've talked about this uh, in the context of state law, talking about sort of presumptive sentences. Same concept that we're talking about here. We're going to start here. The, the defense and the prosecution are going to try to move it up or down to try to get you know, sort of a, a just outcome, a just sentence. And as we go through these different factors, we're going to see how these things work, whether they move up or down. We've got here now, if a person is convicted of a, an offense that falls within this category, but it's not one of these exceptions, it's actually going to be a more serious offense. It's not going to be a base offense level 18. It's going to go up to 22. And what does this look like in a big chart like this? So here we can use that same example. If you're under one section of the U.S. code, it's going to be a offense level 18. And here you can see 27 to 33 months is going to be the range for somebody who is a category one offender. If that same person right, is charged with a different kind of permutation, a different subsection of it's a different crime because it's a different statute, then it's not going to be that base layer 18. It's going to bump it up to the base layer 22 here. And what does that do for the sentence? Well, it, it increases it dramatically. It goes from a minimum of 27 now to a minimum of 41. It goes from a max of 33 months all the way up to 51 months, right? So it's dramatically more serious. And you can see it's just sort of bouncing around based on different statutes and how a person has been charged. Now, there are other things that are going to cause a person to go up and down. And you're going to see these are called departures from the base level. And so we're going to go through some of those and see exactly how this works. See how, you know, what, what, in other words, what Judge Kitanji Brown might have been doing to push these things towards the minimum. Holly's going to come out here. I've got more examples of him next. And he's going to say, look, the prosecution came out and they recommended something high, but the judge ended up going low. So the, basically the argument that Holly is saying is here, he's saying that right here, you know, let's say, let's say Kitanji, uh, according to the prosecutors, should have been sentencing somebody at base level 22. But she actually sentenced somebody at base level 18, while Holly is saying that is showing favoritism to these child predators. Now, there's uh, you know, some interesting stuff here. Let's talk about this, though. Here is Holly one more time sort of detailing some of the cases that he and his team have uncovered looking into Kitanji. United States versus Down, that's a case where the defendant distributed 33 graphic images and videos of child sexual assault to an anonymous messaging app, unfortunately, a practice that's becoming more common. The federal guidelines recommended 70 to 87 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 70 months in prison. Judge Jackson sentenced him to only 60 months. Again, that's the lowest level that was so permitted 70 by law to in that 60. case. The United States versus Stewart. The defendant there distributed scores of images of children suffering sexual abuse. The guidelines recommended 97 to 121 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 97 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave him 57 months. In United States versus Sears, the defendant distributed over 100 videos of child pornography. The guidelines recommended 97 to 121 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended 97 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave him 71 months. Okay, so if we take a look at that, we can see that there are some departures happening. So if the prosecutor, if we go back here and let's say that they were in this sort of 97 month range, and uh, Judge Jack, so that would, let's say just by example, that we're at a base level 30, you know, saying 97 is the recommendation. And Judge Jackson gave him 70, what did he say, 70 or 78, something right in that range. So dropping it, let's say from 39, 29, 28, 27. So we'll drop down three to the 70 to the 87 range. And so you can see what Holly's doing. He's saying, look, 
he's going through and he's picking out every one of these saying, well, you know, prosecution came back and recommended this, but we dropped this a couple base layers down, down to 70 to 87 or whatever the numbers are. You can see how the mechanics work. That is Holly. Now I want to sort of uh, show you this before we get to this, before we start reading that. I have a question about how Holly got his sampling, of course, on this. And my question, of course, is, uh, does what does this sample look like? So for example, if we have a bar chart, bar graph, kind of uh, a, a bell curve here, what am I talking about? This is a bell curve, not a bar chart, bell curve. Here are, is a bell curve. And my question would be, uh, is there, let's say that on this side, we have uh, harsh penalties over against, uh, let's say the defendant over here, we have lenient. So we'll just say, uh, we'll just call these sort of lenient. And uh, then in the middle, we have sort of the presumptive, right? We have some cases where you kind of just don't really go up or down. You kind of just start there in the middle. You don't, you know, you don't aggravate it or, uh, or, or sort of minimize it at all. You keep it right there in the center without any upward or downward departures. Here, you can see that I, my, you know, my question is, does Ketanji Brown is the sampling that Holly is coming up with? Is it coming from this? Like, is this the meaty part of the curve? Do all the cases look like this? Like, is there any harsh sentences in the distribution of her cases? Or is he only just kind of picking out a handful of, let's say, you know, she's done a hundred cases. He goes, if she did a hundred cases and she's got 10 that are lenient, 10 that are harsh, and we'll say 80 that are sort of normal. Is he only picking the 10? I don't know. You know, who knows? I don't know what her entire record looks like or how she's going to respond to that question, but that's a question that I just have on his sampling because obviously she's been a judge for a long time. Now, I want to show you how this judge might be going towards a downward deviation, a, a downward departure. Here you can see under that same subsection, it says, look, if subsection A2 applies, the defendant's conduct was limited to receipt or solicitation of the materials and the defendant did not intend to traffic in or distribute the material, it says decrease it by two levels. Because what they're saying is this mitigates the harm. They're saying, all right, look, this person, he uh, didn't like, he, he wasn't going to distribute it. He wasn't intending to like read traffic this out there. He wasn't like, you know, becoming a, a, a peddler in this stuff. It looks like he just got it. It was limited to the receipt or he just asked for it. That's it. So we're not gonna punish that person as harshly drop that down two levels. If the material though, involves somebody who was under the age of 12, increase it by two levels, right? So now we start to say, okay, listen, same type of offense, but if the category of the victim is, you know, extra young, essentially, we, that's, that's even worse. And so we're gonna aggravate the penalty. So in certain situations that right, the judge might be able to find that subsection one applies. Somebody says, well, you know, look, we, we, I, I went through all of this, analyzed it, believe that this defendant who has been convicted of this offense intended not to transmit it. And so the judge might be able to grant him a downward departure. Same thing here. This says apply the greatest. So sort of don't stack all of these up, right? You don't go, uh, you know, reduce five levels, reduce five levels, reduce five levels, reduce six levels, reduce seven. Oh, you're going home today. It's not like that. Here it says, if the offense involved distribution for pecuniary gain, increase the number of levels from a table. I'm sorry. Let's see, uh, to the retail, but not less than five levels. Okay, so that's sort of if there's money involved. If the defendant distributed in exchange for any valuable consideration, but not for gain. Okay, so it's sort of, um, it's not financial, but there is some sort of consideration, some sort of transfer of value there. Increase it by five levels. If it involves distribution to somebody who's a minor, increase it by five levels. Another one, increase by six levels. If this was intending to, put, to sort of uh, coerce them into other illegal activity. If the offense involved distribution, increase seven levels. And here you can see increase by two levels if they knowingly engaged in distribution uh, these are all sort of distribution offenses. So you can see how they can, they can go, you know, it can get really serious depending on the type of distribution. We have a couple more examples here. This one says, if the offense involved material that is sadistic or masochistic for levels, if it is showing that a pattern of this happens with minors, five levels, right? Harsher sentences for a pattern that might exist. If the offense involved the use of a computer, increase two levels. And then we saw that when you have more images, you can also increase levels. So 
at least 10 images, but fewer than 150, you go up. You're aggravated two levels. Another 150 images, but less than 300, you go up three levels. At least 300 images, but fewer than 600, go up four levels. And if you're over 600, five levels. We just kind of, kind of just bump you up there. And so you can see, right, it, it sort of depends. You know, some of this stuff is uh, asking, right? Is somebody spending tons of time gathering hordes of this stuff? Is this something that was a one-off type of a, you know, a, a weird, um, you know, thing that happened? Who knows, right? There, there's, there's a number of different ways that people get into these situations. And this is, is saying that according to the law, that it's going to penalize people based on the quantity of those images. So you can, you can imagine a situation where somebody, you know, in one night gobbles up hundreds of images, whereas uh, somebody doesn't, right? Somebody might take, you know, five, five years to assemble a, a similar quantity of images or, or maybe never reaches that quantity and they're going to be penalized differently. And so, you know, this is what the, the practicalities that the law has to deal with, you know, it's these complex things. And some people might look at that and say, that doesn't really make any sense. Your quantity of images versus like what's on the image. So, right. It, it's, it's complex, but this is what lawyers and judges are doing here. This gives us some definitions on exactly what we're talking about here. Images means any visual depiction defined by us code for the purpose of this. It says each photograph or computer generated image of a similar depiction is going to be considered one image. So if the number of images substantially underrepresents the number of people, an upward departure may be warranted. So you know, they can actually increase it. If the length of the video is more than five minutes, another upward departure may be warranted, right? These things may continue to go up, but there are other things as we have seen that the judge can use to mitigate this down to a, a, a downward departure. And that's sort of in a whole different section of you know sentencing and mitigation, which is a critical part of the law. And so we see here, right, Josh Howley is, is technically correct that there are cases where Judge Kitanji Jackson Brown is reducing the ultimate sentence for these different offenders, but it's really hard to tell whether there's any, you know, nefariousness to this. Does she have a special uh, propensity for these types of defendants? Is this a small sample of an otherwise sort of regular distribution of judges? Is there any uh, other evidence that maybe she is uh, supportive of these people or is she just a judge who's looking at the cases that come in front of her and deciding, you know, these people deserve, uh, you know, this outcome based upon the facts that I have seen on this particular case. I've weighed all the evidence and I made a decision. And so we're going to know a lot more. She's going to get asked a lot of questions about this. Uh, here throughout the rest of her confirmation hearings, but I couldn't help but notice this. Now, this was part of her opening statement, and it was a beautiful statement, you know, and listen, I know here, you know, I do my best not to simp for a fellow defense attorney, but she was a public defender, and she is somebody who, uh, who I've, I've heard speak previously, and I happen to like what she says about people who have been, you know, sort of in the justice system being treated poorly being impactful on her and then that being something that she has used to become a better judge and a better advocate right sort of recognizing the humanity in the process and it may sound obvious but a lot of judges don't a lot of judges treat people like case numbers and manila file folders and it makes me sick because it doesn't serve that person. It actually turns that person, in my opinion, into somebody that's resentful of the justice system, somebody who is disdainful of the consequences that have been put upon them. And then they actually come out of the justice system in a worse position. And that's not good for society at all. It sort of makes everything worse, not better. So here is a sort of a, a nice opening statement from Kitanji Brown Jackson, telling us a little bit about where she came from and about her family. And it's hard for me to think that somebody like this is really somebody who supports child predators. What do you think? Let's listen in. A little over 50 years ago in September of 1970, Congress had enacted two civil rights acts in the decade before. And like so many who had experienced lawful racial segregation firsthand, my parents, Johnny and Ellery Brown, Look left at those their hometown parents. of Miami, Florida, and moved to Washington, D.C. to experience new freedom. Love it. When I was born here in Washington, my parents were public school teachers. And to express both pride in their heritage and hope for the future, 
they gave me an African name, Kitanji Onyika, which they were told means lovely one. My parents taught me that unlike the many barriers that they had had to face growing up, my path was clearer so that if I worked hard and I believed in myself in America, I could do anything or be anything I wanted to be. Like so many families in this country, they worked long hours and sacrificed to provide their children every opportunity to reach their God-given potential. My parents have been married for almost 54 years Woo. and they're here with me today. I cannot possibly thank them enough for everything they've done for me. I love you, mom and dad. Ah, so, you know, something like that. I love you, mom and dad. It just gets me right in the heart. I can't help it. I'm sorry, but it's really, you know, I think, I think what we are seeing now in our political uh, sort of uh, kangaroo circus is everything has to be ultra political and everybody has to kill each other over every single uh, battle that comes up. And unfortunately, that's just reality. And I'm not somebody who's going to sit here and say the Republicans should just uh, sort of, you know, bend over on this thing because the Democrats largely started this. They started this with gang rape Kavanaugh. They started this back with Bork. They turned that into a verb. So, you know, the idea that we're going to exist in this uh, political game of patty cake anymore, I think is long gone. And so even though Josh Hawley and his you know, you know, particular political perspective here, I think is erroneous in my opinion, it's within bounds, unfortunately, right? It's kind of a bummer that this is what happens. But if the other side is going to do that and the other side doesn't respond, then they're playing at a disadvantage. They're not playing according to the same rules. And so I think it's totally fair game. Unfortunately, I think it's a big problem that the Democrats started this process very recently with Kavanaugh making up allegations out of thin air. You're going to see the Republicans do this. And this is the pendulum that swings back and forth. Every time this happens, you're going to see both sides think that they can get away with a little bit more and the rhetoric is going to continue to ratchet up. But when I watch a video of this woman pointing to her parents and we look at these two people sitting here, school teachers been married for 54 years, telling her that she can accomplish anything because of her God-given talents in this great country that's getting better. I think she's going to be confirmed. I think she probably should be confirmed. And there's a lot worse judges that America could have, a lot less, in my opinion. I, look, I don't know what she's going to rule or how she's going to rule when she gets on the bench. But what we're seeing here, my humble opinion, is not a radical. Doesn't mean that the Republicans should let up, go in there. And when the Republicans take over control, they should do the same thing that they, the Democrats did to them and have a lot of fun with it. Form their own stupid fake select committee and go subpoena their phone records too. This is what it's all come down to. It's a sad state of affairs. This is the reality of the world. And if one side lays down and doesn't play the game by those rules, they lose, don't they? What do you think? Let me know down in the comments below. I'm going to get up and shut those blinds. I'll see you on the next one.